Um, I need to start by thanking first of all Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and Mr. Makarov personally, because I always believe that really to address development issues you have also some political mandate. I'm not saying that the Latvian Minister of Foreign Affairs was uh, often uh, before he joins this issue, but you really see different dimensions, different courage. And I think it's important that, uh, um, well, uh, in the future this uh, tension is cut politically because it, it is political. It is not just technical work that is being doing, and I believe that today's event is a uh, really good uh, manifestation of this much more stronger attention of Latvian political decision makers to take it as a political issue, not just as one of the issues stemming from EU action. And I think that's important. Also grateful to LAPAS. Uh, actually, there have been 10 years of Concord, and uh, and first time actually I heard about, about Concord um, uh, from LAPAS. Uh, so it was interesting that they uh, at that time the leader of LAPAS said, well, you don't be afraid of Concord, they are nice people. And actually, she was right. So, so that's how we came up uh, coming to Concord. So I think, in a sense, thank you for a nice uh, introduction. And uh, also to thank the man moderator, because I believe it is a it, uh, it's intellectual issue and it is definitely important that Latvia intellectual elite very much address the issue because it's again not about where we spend the money and how we spend the money. It's a bit different. What we would like to be, what is a, what is a nation's aspiration. Uh, and that I think is where I put my starting point is. As older I get and as I more see, uh, the more I have natural willingness to come to be Armenians, to live in some cave. Uh, because the world is so complex, so difficult, and, and basically what I would like to have is just peace and quietness and senses. And why it comes in, though? So, because actually there is no clear driver of why we are in this world. And I think philosophers have been actually right, because what I would care is that I have enough food and some entertainment. So that's what I basically would be uh, like uh, addressing. And then the issue of inputs and outcomes, it's very it's tricky. In Latvia, it's a lot of discussion about Euro. But Euro is only me. Actually, what we would like to achieve, that is more important. What we would like to achieve is that people have stability uh, in their lives, so they better ones. That they have more economic opportunity, and definitely that they have more political opportunity. How to express it is in the reasonable voice, it would be by far it's rather difficult, and I think in this Euro debate, in that case, it's, good. it's one of the um, well, one of the cases where you 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 put a lot of attention on the inputs and actually don't speak about outputs. And I think that is a weakness of any political debate until now that I have seen also globally. And post 2015 debate, I think it's the first one. Well, basically, we speak about outputs or like outcomes in the best case. And I think it's important to emphasize what we are trying to discuss. It's not about development cooperation in classical. Because development cooperation, in principle, it's solidarity, it's support, it's help. What post-2015 agenda is, in the world we would like to live. That's what we would like to have. That is why the issues we would like to address. And that's why this agenda that we would like to build should be the one that we would wish to ourselves, first of all, because we are not different than it. And that, I think it is universality, it's very crucial. Then there is another issue that I think most of us in this room are the other young people. But then it is also the sustainability issue, because even assuming that Earth will disappear because of some comet coming or on or, or sun exploding. It is so distant future that somehow I assume that um, Earth is eternal. And that means that I would like that the life continue after well, my time or well if I have reverse. So it, it goes on and there is no major problems in the world. And I would come to it what means something the challenges a lot, the problems and so on. So my point is that post 2015 agenda is an opportunity to really to agree on the world we would like to, to have. And agree also on some some rules for this and some responsibilities for this. It's a bit like traffic rules. Uh, 
Uh, I have now been driving cars in, in, in well in, in in Europe. I have driven my own car in the UK, and so I have been driving on the right side and on the left side. But I would say basically it's it's the same. It's not too much difference because what we would like to avoid is that there is collision and somebody gets killed. So I think that's what we try to establish with traffic rules. And exactly the same in my opinion, we try to establish this post-2015 agenda that there are no casualties. Where casualties are coming? It's wars, it's uh, well food, not sufficient food, it's not sufficient water. Uh, there where the casualties are coming. Are we well, well defended in this part of the world about these casualties? To the point, yes. To the point, yes. But uh, I would still say we don't know, for example, the impact of climate change uh, also for, for Latvia. So uh, we are on the lowlands. So this is a sea of water races, perhaps it is a challenge for us. So I would like to avoid any type of risk in this sense. And, um, and there is a possibility from previous experience really to establish this traffic rules because MDG process basically was designed to help the most poorest people, but with a global support. And as the time comes closer to 2015, people are saying, well, it's, it's, it was right. It was right because it helped at least focus attention and for governments to address particular policies to provide food, uh, provide access to water, sanitation, and also to look on the incomes uh, for the most poor. And the world has to get better. But is it sufficient? No. It's very clear not sufficient. And then the other issues come in. Because to be, well, satisfied with the life, it's not, as I simplifiedly said, it's uh, what I am interested in is just uh, well, food and entertainment. Because part of entertainment is good job, at least, well, not for me, <laughs> but for young people, it's they still feel the aspiration for good job matters. So that is one of this. The second, that I don't feel this privilege because of my income level. And then the issue of inequality is raising, because it's not only that, uh, well, rich people is something that, uh, well, we know, that, no, it's not about it. It's about being fair in distribution of balance. And that is rather a tricky issue because where well, we stop with this, but still, inequality issue in general is a, is, is a challenge. So when the Commission started to think about it, and we, when we put forward, we basically put like five blocks, and it was more or less followed. First, that no one should suffer from the things that you could prevent. It is access to food, uh, nutrition food, access to water, access to sanitation, giving at least decent means to survive. Uh, and it's not the case, like now there was this animation of crisis, in, food crisis in Somalia, and it brought 215,000 deaths, and basically about half, half of this were having children under five. So this was preventable. So, but it's really extreme poverty. Then you give the elements, what this means sustainable development in the core. It's access to energy, access to, uh, access to infrastructure, access to uh, education. And education not anymore just informs that I am, have been two days at school, but actually I have some knowledge. Of it. I think that is a sex second. Third, so it's transforming economies for jobs and inclusive growth. And, uh, uh, inclusive goals, it means this equity issue comes in. Fourth, building peace and, uh, and uh, uh, effective, open, accountable institutions and security. Because what I personally hate most in the world, it is violence. And where I am proud about the panels that came out um, in the, well, these goals, they said that um, eradicate all type of violence against women and girls. This country is not the one that has a, a lot of discussion about this issue or, and a lot of attention in the issue. But in lots of parts of the world, it's really devastating uh, what you see and hear about this violence. And it was first time formulated. And also formulation, another formulation that I like a lot, uh, avoid child marriages. Because that, I think, that is really strong change 
it's this behavior change that we try to eliminate all type of violence. And I believe we need support of civil society if we would like to survive in this, because these are moral categories. It's not so much measurable, but uh, it is definitely important this framework includes it. And so last but not least, it's, uh, it's forging a new global partnership. And it is a partnership that we understand that there is no, well, I would, with the simplicity, this is private sector. Because private sector until today, and it is, I think, most shareholders would say, about the profits. Profits make uh, market value increases. And what we, we say is that if it's such attitude continues on part of society, or part of global uh, institutions, then you don't have a chance really to establish, well, decent life for everyone. And the best good example is in Bangladesh. So you have a story building where people, well, thousands of people are working, you store generators on top, building collapses, and it is just green. And it can't be like this. It, it is just green, and, and it's, we could say it's government failure, but first of all, it's really a corporate business they should not tolerate it, because if they don't tolerate it, says, we have always come to late some particular cases. And I think that's what I mean with this global problem. So I think this post-2015 process, we could discuss more, but I will say that it's universality, sustainability, and it's, it's, it's a roadmap what we would like to achieve for everybody. And I think that's quite a, quite a high point. Now about the civil society organizations, because uh, uh, it is a crucial element in any society. And even if it's now in European societies, it's, uh, I would say, some ice age for civil society activities, I still believe that as an individual, uh, and I'm coming from myself, I would say, as long as I have no problems, I don't care about anything. Neither for state, neither for civil society. Fine. I am fine. When I have a problem, First, I expect the state will take care of me. Well, in most cases, if it's decent state, it will take care of me. But there are could be cases in between when state doesn't care about me. And I stay alone, exposed with my tragedy, and no one cares about me. And then the civil society is actually the only one that basically will defend me. And that's why for me, civil society is activity of strength actually is defense of my individual freedom and my individual survival. And it's difficult really to formulate this much more stronger, but it's about my protection. And that's why we try really to not only through civil society provide support for most poorest people. It's not the main objective. It's actually the main objective that people are not indifferent. That people should understand that, well, if you unite defending an issue, and it could be, well, question of sometimes issue, then you protect, actually, the most vulnerable. Most vulnerable, and most vulnerable, it's not necessarily the most poor. It can be part of us. And I think that is where this strength coming. And last point on younger member states. Well, this is a bit artificial issue. And uh, in my opinion, there is only, uh, I think we should just speak about member state in a way. I know that there are things that we would need to deal with, and that's what I expect from Concord and also LAPAS, how to use financial instruments. And Mr. Makaros spoke with me that they help, um, don't exclude the, the civil society of new member states out of it. And I think that is important where um, Concord in particular could help to build the schemes uh, that will make it possible to them fully participate and grow the participation. I think that's, that is very crucial, that no member state is being left out because of instrument design, European instrument design, because we need each of them. But if I say this particular experience, I have seen, for example, a Czech organization in, uh, working in Ethiopia with women, and what I like, but I believe it is not just a Greek experience. It basically was empowerment of women through their work to get politically more stronger. So it's very, the basic idea is there is small money invested. Women, well, basically 
make some economic activities with government, so they got more money. Uh, it's hard work, actually. But they also organize themselves. So it's basically seed money and some of the education money. And you get, at the end of the day, not only better life for these particular women, but you get completely different mindset where Ethiopian politicians that are rather hard to persons are trying to really to engage with them because they feel political strength behind this city. And in these type of projects, it's not big scale project. But I believe these type of projects is exactly what I would come to expect from new member countries. And on in this respect, I always argue that we need to increase, uh, especially for new member countries, the financing for um, uh, for, for development aid. But it's not for building roads, not for building electros, uh, power stations. I am asking that they support the civil society organizations, bringing ideas of freedom and self-conscience or self-esteem uh, to the world. I think that's where I believe the new younger member countries, even the Cape, has particular, uh, particular uh, uh, niche. Because we came out of oppression and dictatorships, one or another form of dictatorship. And this, this feeling of freedom is by far more stronger, I would say, is still in memory compared with the countries that basically since the Second World War had no perturbation. I think that is natural niche of the new member countries. This Czech project very much uh, emphasizes. But I should be unique. It should be well um, the, the right issue. So I think these are some issues that could be dealt with. And then is uh, well uh, some issues that I always preach to my particular African um, African colleagues and also the leaders of these countries. Courage of reform reforms. Courage of reforms is in new member countries definitely has been immense. Immense uh, and you can't always copy the political situation. I, for example, mean property rights. Because restitution of property, I, I believe what Baltic states meant, it, it's unique political experience. Because you not only establish property, but you go through the rate of well, giving that form of property, uh, property and getting all the social consequences out of it. It's an enormous political process that definitely uh, transformation you went in. And I believe it's definitely worth to study, and it's, uh, in some cases also to take some examples. But I don't think that it should be purpose per se. I believe that unions should, uh, goal should be bring freedom and uh, to the people. Thank you. I am all the more than that. Um, it's a like, question about your wallet, they should join 2014 or not. Um, you will never find big critical mass. Uh, in society for this. It is a political courage to lead. I think that's what it's about. And UN process should, uh, or the governments engage, should find the way to lead the way. Because there will be never critical mass to push this. Business as usual is okay, basically, for most of us, I would say. You know, no, perhaps a more ambitious audience, but normal audience would say, well, business is not so bad. Right? Why should I change anything? And this vision is very much political vision. That I think where the political role is, not to stay on business as usual scenario. You could make mistakes, but you should leave. And this is again, and there's this parallel with Latvian government. They took a risk to this. They are defending this. And I think, well, society is some is supporting, some are not supporting. Uh, that's clear. But they took responsibility to move it forward, not because it was business as usual. Business as usual would say, we will join Europe one day. And I think that is important that it grows in bigger ambition uh, globally, but also responsible ambition to implement it later. And I think that's uh, what it's all about. So business as usual could be a scenario. I couldn't exclude it because uh, most parts of the world is, is uh, satisfied how they live. Okay, thank you.